In this video, we're going to talk about Pythagoras' equal temperament and the birth of the Western chromatic scale uh, in hopes of developing some mathematical ideas that help us understand how the guitar fretboard works. So a little bit of background on sound first, uh, some de get some definitions out of the way. So sound is really a perception by the human ear of vibrations of an object. So whether that's the plucking of a string or it is a, a sound of a hammer uh, hitting the head of a nail, the, the, the sound that we perceive is a, is a function of those vibrations, and those vibrations are picked up by the human ear. Now, roughly speaking, uh, vibrations, when, when they occur, what they do is they push and pull air molecules, for a lack of better words at the moment. So basically, we're, we're sort of either pushing air or pulling air in, and vibrations do both. When something vibrates, it pushes air out, and then it contracts back in and pss, sort of pulls that those air molecules back into place. So that's, that's how those vibrations actually work. So there's a physical action causing those vibrations, and that's the, the movement of air molecules. As in trigonometry, um, we, we associate sound with frequencies. So there are various sounds, obviously. You can even hear in my voice there are lots of different frequencies taking place. And uh, uh, the frequency, as in trigonometry, is the number of vibrations that occur per second. So uh, we're going to define it as per unit time. So how many vibrations occur per unit time? And you can see this whenever you do pluck a string or you, you, you play it in slow motion or you get a really good camera, you can actually, actually you can look at the string from the side and you can see it vibrates when you pluck it. And these vibrations result in an oscillation. And the number of oscillations every second is, is again, the frequency. So a little bit more uh, of, of the sound background. You're probably familiar with high sounds and low sounds. And the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch of the sound. And, and uh, so that we perceive it as being, uh, you know, more of a squeaky sound or fingernails on the chalkboard. Really high frequencies don't feel good to the human ear. Low frequencies or low sounds have low pitches. So think about bass when you're listening to music and you crank up the bass. Uh, you are increasing the, the, the amplitude of those lower frequencies. And by the way, amplitude is what we associate with volume. Uh, you have frequency, and then you have the amplitude of the frequency, which is, you know, how how loud that particular frequency is to be heard. Now, uh, when we're born, we can usually hear, on average, the average person can hear somewhere between uh, a, in a range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz is really just 20,000 hertz. And hertz is a unit of frequency measurement. We'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, hertz is the essentially the number of oscillations per second. So hertz you can think of as cycles per second or oscillations per second. So it helps us quantify sound. Uh, 20 hertz sound we know is going to be really low. 20,000 hertz is going to be really high. And um, as you get older, the minimum doesn't usually change. So usually you can hear bass notes really well all your life. But as you get older, the maximum in that range begins to diminish. So in your 20s, uh, it's kind of depressing when you hear this at first, but that lower, that higher range tends to go down. So you don't hear 20,000 hertz, but in your 30s, you know, you may only hear as as, a, as high uh, of a pitch up to 14,000 hertz. Interesting experiment to try if you find a tone generator online, if you just Google tone generator, and you can play these high frequencies, uh, let's say to a, a parent or a child or someone who's a, of a different age than you, and see what the maximum perceived frequency is, you'll, you'll, you'll come across some pretty uh, fascinating information. Now, in terms of quantifying, we've got to quantify frequency, right? Because if, if we're going to mathematize something, we've got to have quantities to work with. So the unit of frequency is called the hertz, or the hert, uh, if it's a singular uh, vibration per second, and it's a uh, it really has a strange unit of one per second if you were to do a unit analysis. But I like to, uh, or some people will just say per second. I like to say cycles per second because that just kind of emphasizes that it's the number of vibrations. So, like in this case, uh, what we're looking at here is the displacement of the string. So, if you can imagine the string kind of oscillating, so I've got this string that's suspended between two points, and so it's just suspended, we'll say, roughly straight across. And when you pluck this thing, it starts to move up. It's got an upward displacement and a downward displacement. It kind of vibrates up and down, right? And so if you were to keep track of that over time, you would notice that at first the string goes up, and then it goes down, and then back up, and then back down, and so on and so forth. Okay, well, in one second, if we look at this uh, as time, we see that this uh, particular string 
doesn't quite complete a full oscillation, right? And a full oscillation would be between here and here. So the period or the time it takes to complete a full oscillation is four seconds. And in one second, we only get one fourth of that because we can think about this sine wave as being divided into four pieces. And you can see that yeah, each, each of these pieces, we only get a quarter of that cycle. So this particular note would be a quarter hertz. Okay, so definitely totally imperceptible, uh, but by the human ear, but it is a frequency nonetheless. So a little bit about standard tuning. So you have the guitar fretboard, and uh, tunings you know vary tremendously. But every string usually has its standard uh, note that it's tuned to. So usually the the lowest string here is tuned to an E, and uh, the next string is tuned to an A and D and G and B and E. So that's the standard tuning. Of course, there are many many tunings. Now this E is a much lower E than this E up here. Um, and so it's interesting to note that we can have, we can play an E sound, but it can have a different, uh, a different frequency. So well, as we'll soon see, if you double uh, a frequency, you get the same note, but it's a, in what we call a different octave. Okay, so the way that, uh, that this, this works is that each note as you move your way up, and you'll notice that the spacing, these are called frets, and the spacing between any two frets, for example, this one and this one, uh, you can see that if you compare the, let's say, these two frets here, now this is what we call the second fret. The metal bars are really what, uh, what the frets are. If you wanted to point at a fret on the guitar, you'd point at the metal bars. But if you're playing between the first fret and the second fret, we say that you're playing the second fret. If you're playing between the one, two, three, Three, the third fret and the fourth fret, we say that you are in the fourth fret, and so on and so forth. But as you notice later on down here, you notice that the distance between any two adjacent frets gets to be smaller and smaller. So uh, we have larger spaces, larger spaces, and you can see as you gradually work your way towards uh, over here somewhere, you'll have the actual bridge to which the strings are um, tied, and the closer you get to that bridge, you uh, also reduce the spacing between any two frets. Okay, so uh, it doesn't really matter how you uh, how you look at these notes. In terms of the Western chromatic scale, by convention, um, you know why why does the fretboard look like this? Well, it really is more of a conventional thing. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means it sounds right. Pythagoras, yep, that's right. The guy who uh, after whom we know the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared for right triangles, among many other things. He actually was experimenting with sound way back uh, in that day. And he, he experimented with various tunings, and tunings are really sets of frequencies. So, right, like in this case, these all have, this is a particular tuning, and this is called the standard tuning, and that's just a set of frequencies, so that when two people pick up the guitar and they're both tuned the same way, they can play the same chords and they'll sound exactly the same. Pythagoras, when he experimented with these different tunings that he thought sounded good or pleasing to the human ear, he found that adjacent notes, that is, uh, if you think about adjacent notes, that is, if you were to uh, pick a string by fretting in the first fret, and you compared it to that same string fretted in the second fret, that uh, those are what we call adjacent notes. So the next note after the first fret is the note in the second fret, after that is the note in the third fret, and so on. And he found that the the way to best do this, or to him the, the best way to do this, it sounded most pleasing, was for those frequencies uh, of adjacent notes to have a common multiplier or a common ratio. Um, same same concept. And that what that's what sounded the best to him. Well, that concept is known as equal temperament, and uh, that equal temperament led to what we now use as the Western chromatic scale, which is how, for example, a guitar is set up. It's set up to play Western chromatic scale. So if you listen to a sitar or you listen to uh, Eastern world instruments, you notice that it's not something you can quite play on a guitar because their tunings are and their, um, their, their temperaments are different than the temperaments that we're used to in the West. Um, and again, we call this that because, you know, most Western world music is based upon the scale. Now, uh, the Western chromatic scale is, is easily demonstrated by the circle to emphasize that it doesn't really matter what note you start on. So, for example, most common, you know, key to play in oftentimes is C. 
And if you go around the circle, then you notice that you'll end back up at C. And every time you end back up at C, you are in the what we call the next octave. Um, and the reason we call it an octave is because that's eight, uh, eight notes up. But uh, the convention is to call the first note C, the next note, uh, which is called a half step. So these are all called half steps. And this half step is basically what we would call the C sharp is adjacent to the C. Now, you can also call that D flat. Uh, we're going to stick with the sharps. So we're going to ignore the flats. Uh, the flats are really just used for musical theory, uh, but a D flat is the same thing as a C sharp. So C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, and then you'll notice it goes from E to F. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Um, quite frankly, you could probably look up the history about it, but we, could, we might as well have called these triangle, square, circle, smiley face. These are just naming conventions. It's just the way it is. Um, that's all that can be said, and that's all that's really important. So C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F. There's no E sharp. Well, there is, but it would just be F. Then there's F sharp. The next note is called G. The next note is called G sharp. The next note is called A. Um, so again, you notice that it doesn't go G sharp H, it goes G sharp A, and then A, A sharp, A sharp B, and then B back to C, you notice there's no B sharp uh, listed in the scale. So this is how it works. Now any note you start on, you, uh, you, you've you played one octave when you've gone around the circle one time. So basically from here to here, I would be, have played one octave. And I could start at a G, so the next note, if I started with a G, would be a G sharp, and then an A, and then an A sharp, and a B, and a C, and a C sharp, and a D, and a D sharp, and an E, and an F, and an F sharp, and I'd be back to G, and I'd be, uh, again, one octave um, into the scale. So it's called an octave. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why we call it an octave, mainly because if you're playing in a major scale, uh, you, you have what's what's called the whole, uh, sorry, whoops, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, meaning that if I were playing C major, I would, I would first of all, my, my next note in the C major scale would be uh, a whole step. Now, a whole step is two half steps, so it would be uh, not C sharp, but D. So it would be a C, then a whole. So basically, you're skipping over a note to do a whole step. And then an E, and then a half step, which would be an F, and then another whole step, which would be a G, and another whole step, which would be an A, and another whole step, which would be a B, and then a half step, which would put me back at C. That's called a C major scale. And how many notes are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight is the octave, and octa, or octagon, if you think about polynomial um, uh, geometric shapes, you are talking about um, eight um, objects with eight of some sort of quality. Now, what are the mathematical relationships here among these frequencies? Well, we said that uh, that a particular note um, or two adjacent notes should have frequencies that are common that have common ratios. So, what does that mean? Well, every single note has its own frequency. So, whenever you don't fret the string at all, but you just pluck over here, you pluck the string as what we call an open note. You're going to get a certain frequency. Now, to have a numerical example, since this is the E string, the, e, the low E string is typically tuned to a frequency of about 82 hertz. Okay, so uh, in order to make that sound, that means that that string essentially vibrates uh, 82 times per second. Okay, so that's, that's pretty quick already. The higher strings have uh, higher frequencies, and, and as you'll notice that you play higher strings, you see less vibration because it's taking place so quickly. Um, and so now if I play that open note, I, I should have 82 hertz. Now, if I would fret this string right here in the first fret and pluck again, I'm going to get a slightly higher sound. Um, and that frequency of that note, which I'm just going to call F1, because I don't know what that should be, it should be the case that if I take 82 and I multiply it by some, by some factor, which I'll call R, I should get the frequency of the note in the first fret. Okay, so the next note, if I were to fret this string uh, in the second fret, and I would get a frequency of F2. Well, what should F2 be? Well, we said that the frequency between any two adjacent notes should have a comp the comp same common ratio. So if I take F1 and I multiply it by R, I will get F2. We're going to finish, we're going to continue on with this mathematical relationship in the next video, but this is a good place to stop because things are about to get a little hairy.
So I'll see you in the next video.